I would like to uh, uh, say that I'm very honored and uh, privileged to have joined or been elected uh, to this uh, prestigious academy. Uh, but I'm also very uh, grateful after having listened to such wonderful uh, presentations. So I'm going to talk to you briefly about viral diseases in, U uh, in Uganda, new challenges, acquiring new, uh, requiring new approaches. Uh, this is uh, work that uh, I've worked on, led uh, myself together with uh, a number of colleagues, including my students and others that we have uh, collaborated with uh, uh, working together. <clears throat> Uganda was one of the countries that was first recognized having a very bad and, uh, uh, pandemic of HIV, very devastated uh, in the early 80s and the 90s, and registering some of the highest uh, HIV <coughs> uh, prevalence and incidence. It was for that reason that I took uh, 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 a career in uh, research HIV after my medical training and the uh, viral um, immunology uh, training, uh, especially to concentrate on HIV. My work from the beginning uh, looked at, first of all, HIV diversity, uh, part of my work, and to understand what this means. And over a period of time, uh, we did uh, really uh, understand that HIV was quite diverse, especially in uh, the African uh, um, uh, continent. And we described a number of HIV subtypes, including describing uh, HIV subtype G, which, which was minority at that time. But there was quite a number of uh, uh, quite high diversity of HIV. And we used different techniques. Uh, initially, we're using simple serology, using a, a region of the HIV, the V3 loop to serotype HIV. We moved into heteroduplex uh, mobility uh, assays. Uh, and eventually we set up sequencing uh, here at uh, the, uh, my institution. The other observation that we saw at the beginning uh, when we started analyzing samples and we had the opportunity to start looking at more and more uh, specimens uh, was the complication of uh, seeing uh, HIV uh, recombinant viruses and also individuals who had dual infection, individuals who have been infected by more than one subtype. And recombination can occur in two ways. Either an individual is infected at the same at once with two or more strains or sequential infection after being infected with one and then you get an infection with another one. And that can uh, lead into uh, recombination if uh, this uh, virus is two viruses or more than one strain infect one, uh, one cell. And during the replication, there's exchange of genetic material. In fact, one of my PhD students identified individuals who had uh, dual infection and were able to see within, within these individuals uh, recombination. Uh, and that, of course, complicated the HIV diversity within our population. We got very much interested in HIV super infection for the reason that if an individual is infected with one variant or strain, and then after some time, due to high risk behavior, you get infected with another strain, that complicates uh, HIV vaccine design because you wonder if natural infection is failing to protect you against uh, another infection, what miracle can you get uh, to, uh, to get a, 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 a vaccine? Of course, people have argued that individuals who have been infected, already they have uh, an immune system that has been uh, somehow damaged. You can't relate it to uh, an HIV negative individual if you are going to uh, vaccinate them, maybe they may, they may induce a better immune re response. But this super infections phenomenon gave us an opportunity to find out what's the difference between individuals who get super infected and those others that don't uh, get super infected. And one of the things we found out is that actually neutralizing antibodies, especially if they're not matching the super infecting virus, may not be able to prevent all the super infection that you, you have. And that further confirming that although neutralization does work, you need really to match uh, your vaccines to the, uh, to the strains of viruses in the population. So super infection uh, has been a way of really uh, trying to understand what protective immune responses could be, because some people get it perfected and others do not. 
Of course, HIV diversity, when we study HIV diversity, the aim is really to look at intervention. Uh, how would the diversity affect uh, intervention, especially vaccine research, and more recently, uh, generation of monoclonal antibodies. As one of the individuals who participated in the first HIV vaccine trial uh, in Africa, we used a, a vaccine candidate that came from USA, and there was a lot of criticism why we're using a vaccine that has been designed using another strain in an African population. I think the arguments were right, uh, but we argued that conducting HIV vaccine trials is another way of understanding what the relevance of HIV uh, diversity is as uh, vaccines are concerned. Currently, we are conducting the first HIV vaccine efficacy trial in East Africa that we initiated in 2020. Again, we're looking at ways of the vaccine that has conserved regions, but also to understand how vaccine uh, protection can occur in individuals who have different HIV uh, subtypes of diversity. The other work we are doing is generating monoclonal antibodies. Monoclonal antibodies are becoming quite important in HIV uh, studies and, uh, and, and prevention. And, and the, some of you may have uh, listened to this trial that took place in South Africa, where it was clearly indicated that though these antibodies could prevent infection, there very is a breakthrough of infection, again, because of diversity. So our work now is to uh, develop monoclonal antibodies, but also to test them against different HIV strains, including uh, recombinant viruses, to see how uh, uh, diversity of HIV can affect uh, monoclonal antibodies. <clears throat> Another area that is becoming, of course, a challenge as uh, uh, one of the new uh, uh, challenges for HIV now is drug resistance. Uh, we know that uh, uh, there's expansion of uh, antiretrovirus, uh, which many people think, if well uh, managed, uh, could lead, maybe some people can see uh, the possibility of ending the HIV pandemic if antiretrovirals are properly used. However, one of the biggest threats threat that we have is drug resistance. <clears throat> drug resistance may severely uh, affect uh, therapeutic options and treatment, uh, treatment can become very costly because first line regimens are not working, people moving to second line and third line. Hence, we are looking at drug resistance to see how we can prevent drug resistance. And I happen to chair the National HIV Drug Resistance and Monitoring Group and chairing the Technical Working Group. And we have already seen in Uganda, diversity has already affected our first line treatment. We have no, now moved to uh, use of doltegravir in adults and the protease inhibitors uh, because of the uh, resistance, especially to the NNRTI drugs that have been used uh, in first line. So we need to continue monitoring and understanding the new challenges of treatment and resistance that we are seeing. I also want to uh, mention another approach uh, that we are using to understand HIV, the HIV epidemic, uh, and this is using phylogenetics and phylogeography to understand, because people have been saying, we have done all that we can to control and manage HIV. Where do new infections come, come from? We can use epidemiology, of course, but there are times where epidemiology alone, this classic epidemiology may not be enough. So we are using phylogenetics and phylogeography to understand which are the sources of infection. In one of our publications that I've listed here, Already we have shown that in fishing communities, which have quite high HIV prevalence, we see that actually they are not sources of infection, but they are sinks of infection. When you look at the movement of viruses uh, uh, using phylogeography, you can see that they get a lot of infection from sex workers, from the general population, and then they come into the fishing communities, and then from the fishing communities into the larger population. Similarly, in the general population cohort, uh, we have also indicated that. I'd like also briefly to talk about emerging and reemerging infection. As you know, here in Uganda, we are in a tropical country uh, with a, a, a conducive uh, climate, a lot of biodiversity, bio, uh, bio, 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 uh, biodiversity, population growth, uh, travel, etc. And this, of course, uh, has led to a number of outbreaks and new infections that we are seeing. For example, in 20, uh, the year 2000, Uganda had one of its largest Ebola outbreak where we had about 230 individuals who were infected with more than 200 deaths, about 225 deaths. 
from, from that time, we have had many other outbreaks from, uh, from time to time. We set up a very good lab for viral hemorrhagic fever uh, to diagnose so that we can quickly uh, intervene. And that has seriously saved the lives. Before we used to send samples abroad to other places to uh, type, uh, understand, we have Ebola or Marburg, but now we have all the capacity uh, using newer technology to address these pandemics. And that has really made a big difference in that we, are, we can quickly intervene and uh, address the pandemics uh, of emerging infections. Uh, turning to COVID now, COVID-19 pandemic, <clears throat> Uganda had its first case, case of uh, uh, COVID in March 21st uh, in our laboratories here in Entebbe. Uh, we identified an individual who had traveled from abroad, and that was the first case of March 2021. And we started monitoring, continuously monitoring the pandemic, uh, the, HR, uh, the, the, the SARS-CoV-2, and doing a lot of other work uh, to support uh, the, uh, the, the, the pandemic. At the beginning, when we first had, currently, uh, as you can see, we are in our second wave, uh, which started around in, in May. We are continuing in our second wave. We had our first wave around November, December, but the second wave has been more uh, devastating, more infections, more severe cases in our hospitals. So a lot has been uh, uh, happening in the last few weeks, although now we are beginning to see some le uh, leveling off. But one of the work we have been doing, <clears throat> working with the colleagues here, is really to look at the SARS-CoV-2 lineages and variants that we have. At the beginning of the pandemic, uh, when we had individuals who are coming in SARS-CoV-2, we are traveling from different places, a lot of the variants they had, we are matching where these individuals were coming from. If somebody came from the UK, uh, the, uh, the viruses were matching those that were coming from the UK or the US. And that has been the picture in many of the African countries. But later we described a new variant, the A23.1, which evolved from A23 and was first described by our group. It was found in a cluster of infection in a prison in Northern Uganda. By the end of there, towards the end of the year, this variant, the A23.1, had already <clears throat> overtaken all the other variants. Uh, it was quite uh, spreading very fast. It has not yet been uh, described as a variant of concern, but a variant of interest because it has a mutation in the spike that has been associated with the uh, uh, high transmissibility. So we are uh, uh, watching and following uh, these lineages. In the second wave, as I said, we have been sequencing since the first wave. Uh, we are providing the government, the country, with about 20 to 40 genome sequences per month, but we're increasing on that. The first wave, we have A23.1 lineage. Now the second wave, we have been seeing again an increase now of the variants of, of concern and the variants of interest. The variants of interest, the alpha, the beta, but in the last sequences that we have in this second wave, we are beginning to see a dominance of the B, of the Delta variant. Uh, this is again the picture we are beginning to see in some of the Af African countries in South Africa. They are seeing a third wave, and again, they are seeing uh, a dominance of the Delta uh, variant, which is coming on. So we are beginning to see uh, these highly transmissible variants that are coming on. Vaccine coverage, of course, unfortunately, has been quite low, uh, but at least we are encouraging people to vaccinate uh, on the understanding that if people take the second uh, uh, vaccination, they'll be able to be protected from uh, severe disease. I've not had time to show you the immune profiling of our uh, individuals who have been infected, how the immune responses, um, uh, uh, especially neutralizing antibodies, <clears throat> but some of our individuals do show uh, neutralization, and we are very keen to see how the vaccine uh, will fare as we move forward. In my last uh, slide, I also want to uh, uh, talk about new approaches of vaccine design. <clears throat> vaccine design, COVID-19, SARS-CoV-2, has really indicated for Africa that we need to do better in, in terms of vaccine design. Uh, we have been waiting for vaccines from elsewhere. Africa is now behind. Uh, less than maybe 3% have been vaccinated. Yes, other countries are getting 40, 50, 60% vaccination. 
So there is a push into vaccine design. In our lab, in my lab, we have started this even before SARS-CoV-2. We have been working very closely with our colleagues at Imperial College, uh, Professor Robin Shatter. Initially, we were working on the vaccine design for the Rift Valley fever using a self-amplifying RNA. Uh, Robin Shatter is using this approach uh, to develop a SARS-CoV-2 vaccine. But we're also working on inactivated SARS-CoV-2 vaccine, a vector-based vaccine. And partly this is a push both from the government, but also from uh, many others that Africa should really get involved. Uh, as we do all this, new approaches, technology, we have been able over time to really introduce a lot of technology that has allowed us to expand and to do a lot of work in virology, in immunology, so that we have minimal shipment of specimens, but we do most of our work, all our work locally, and that is already proving uh, quite a lot. I'd like to end by acknowledging and thanking colleagues at the MRC unit here in Entebbe, colleagues at the Uganda Virus Research Institute, our funders, uh, especially the UKRI, Medical Research Council, our study participants, and all our collaborators. Thank you.